Paul. Hi. We have Sam Aaron with the Emacs Live hacking. Hi, I'm Sam. Um, <clears throat> I'm quite. Uh, <clears throat> my voice is gone. I've just eaten food. You've all just eaten food. You're probably going to sit down and go to sleep. That's fine. I've got to stand up and talk for 20 minutes. So, um, sorry about it if I fall asleep as well. Now, the thing is, I, I'm quite. I've talked to quite a few audiences before, but I've never talked to an audience where I'm quite scared because you guys clearly have a lot more knowledge than I. Because I've only been using Emacs for a few years now, so I think four years. Uh, and there's people who started giving talks saying, well, I've been using your expert. 35, like 20 years, like 200 years. I haven't done that. So, um, But the cool thing is, the reason why I'm here today is to hopefully I can talk about the things I'm doing, but I can find people who know stuff that I don't, pretty much all ask questions. Because I don't know about you, but I've developed my skills with Emacs completely isolated and on my own. Um, and that's quite a lonely process, and I've always wished... I wish there was a room of people I could just ask it. Well, here you are. So <laughs> this is brilliant. Now, so uh, so if, uh, what I'm showing you, there's some better ways of doing things. Then then please tell me. Put your hands up. Tell me. I'm not here to to, any, to convince you what I'm doing is right or wrong. I just I'm just showing you what I'm doing. Um, and what I'm doing is coming from this from probably a different perspective than maybe you might come with this yourselves. In that <clears throat> I, I I'm trying to move making the, the interesting transition from a, a computer scientist, I have a PhD in computer science, to being an artist. Okay, this is the tradition I want to make, and it's, it's clearly not one motivated by monetary concerns. Um, <laughs> but it is motivated by what I want to do in my life, and who I am, and how I want to express myself, and the kind of things I think are actually important. And, and actually, uh, it, it, perversely, there's all sorts of interesting uh, research opportunities in arts for computer science in the same way that we looked at, say, architecture and created uh, design patterns, you know, like looking at Chris, Christopher Alexander's work. And he was actually a, a mathematician and an architect writing books on language. It's very strange. So actually, sticking in current domain is, is, in my opinion, a very bad idea. And actually, working in a completely different domain is a really great way of actually learning things. And so what I'm going to describe to you is what I've been learning about trying to become an artist and what are the approaches I'm taking. So. Uh, Hopefully, many of you will stick around tonight. So at 7.30, I'm going to be playing music, using all the techniques I'm describing and more. Uh, and so actually, this is, that's my real talk. This is just a fake talk. This is a trailer for that, actually. That's my real talk, because that's actually how I'm demonstrating what I'm doing, actually through practice. Um, and so what am I doing? Well, I'm, I'm seeing programming languages as interfaces in their own rights. So we typically see programming languages as ways to actually do engineering or ways to actually build things. And it's sort of often, for many programmers, like an annoyance. Oh, I have to program that thing because it's not really the programming I want to do. It's the thing I want to build is why people are paying me. Well, obviously, no one's paying me to be an artist. So actually, I, I'm enjoying this for its own right. And so seeing programming as an act in its own, as its own joyful thing, is, is really what, one of the reasons why I'm doing this. Um, and so... I'm seeing programming language as the interface. So uh, what does that mean? Well, for me, that means that the text editor itself is, is part of the interface, and the language is part of the interface. And it means that that's the primary um, mechanism with which I'm communicating with the computer. So I'm not writing programs to do stuff. The programs I'm writing is my communication. That makes any sense? Does that make sense? I'm sure it does to you guys. Um, so I'm creating, I, what I've been doing is I've been cheating, it was as, as all good programmers do. And I've been combining things I've found. So I've sort of seen Emacs as sort of a, I'm like a pirate of Emacs. And I'm sailing around the seas and finding all sorts of awesome treasure, and I'm pulling it in and shoring it in. Um, and so I found lots of cool little small mini projects and, and bits and bobs I've, I've shored in. And over the period of the four years I've been working in Emacs, I've actually developed a config which has incorporated all these things to the extent that when I do like, my performances, people say, whoa, you're using Emacs, I'm using Emacs. I'm doing loads of cool things. What are those things? So I've released those things as part of a project called Emacs Live. Now, I don't expect any of you to use it at all, but maybe it's of interest if you see some things, you think, well, what was that thing? Well, it's all documented and uh, uh, structured in this project. So you can actually find things and see it as sort of a treasure trove yourself of, of interesting snippets to, to pull and, and, and look at. Um, right, I'll use this one as well. That's cool. So... Has anyone made sense so far at all? Any questions at this stage? I mean, I'm, I could be delving into the realms of the abstract. So, let's make this a bit bigger. 
Um, okay, so obviously Emacs is my interface to the language. Uh, in this case, you could have it's Emacs Lisp. That's fine. Um, so you can do things like the doc, auto docking stuff. You know, that's nice. And then doc strings popping up. And obviously, if it's a smaller font, then this also fits on the screen. Um, but the thing is, uh, I see it as an interface to music. So I'm making music. Uh, and, and what does that actually mean when you have an interface to music? Well, it means that Emac becomes my instrument. It's like a musical instrument. And so, in the same way you might imagine playing a violin and learning how to play a violin, I'm playing Emacs and learning how to play Emacs. This is quite a strange thing. Um, and so, the, the tools I'm making are all about that interaction, about how I can actually communicate my ideas, my musical intentions to the systems I'm using through Emacs. And how can I embellish Emacs to enable that act to become friction, frictionless or be more powerful? And it turns out that a lot of those embellishments that I'm creating, just making music, actually turn out to be pretty useful for developing software in general. Actually, a, a large number of people in Nokia, I believe, are using this exact config to do closure development. Um, and they just they have using my musical instruments <laughs> to develop software, which is pretty cool. Um, so let's just show you what that means. So this is a, a live running process. Oh, I've killed it. That no, was that was a live running process, uh, which was a JVM just started, and now I can't because it's still dying. But it will come in a second. Um, so this is typically why I work. So I'm using a language called Clojure typically when I'm developing, um, and Clojure requires you to start a Java virtual machine um, and doing the thing called line again, doing this from the command line. Um, and then it starts a server which listens on a specific port, you can tell. Um, and once that's booting, uh, I can connect to it with this thing called nREPL. I can't see you at the bottom of my screen. Um, if I make it away like that, I don't know. Yeah, exactly, that's what I'm going to do. Um, there we are. Is that good? Yeah. Um, nREPL and say start. It's a bit like uh, some sort of slime thing. Now I'm talking to Clojure. I can say plus one, two, and get results, obviously, it's the same. Uh, pull an overtone out live, and now I can say demonstrate a sign oscillator. I don't have speakers connected, which is a stupid idea. Oh, okay. um, oh, yeah. Real, thanks. Clicking this, and I'm going to blast your ears off the beautiful sine wave. There we are, look at that. So, I can like uh, pull in. Yeah, question? What synth? What synth? Are we? So I could talk about that for hours. Um, so here actually, well, so there's reason that's a, the problem is there's no simple answer. So um, I'm using something called Super Collider, maybe that's your answer, uh, which is a synthesizer generator real time. Um, and this demo sign oscillator actually defines a synthesizer sends it to Super Collider, which then reifies a synthesizer, and then at the same time actually, well, it compiles it to, to bytecode, sends it to Super Collider, reifies it, and then triggers it, and then kills it. So there's lots of things going on. But that is synthesizer being defined and triggered right there on that line. And I mean, I can sign up this trigger, and I can use it for the frequency, or I can use any of these other so-called gens. Oh, that's quite horrible, isn't it? But like a... Uh, uh, well, that that's normally sounds quite nice. Um, I think it's stereo. Uh, oh well, I think it's only it works. anyway. Um, these are all different synthesizers I'm doing on the fly, and you could actually. Um, uh, I'm doing a small tutorial on overdo now, which is not necessarily what I want to do. Um, so development overdo source examples <laughs> compositions. So, um, uh, this is the kind of thing. So, so here I think there's uh, quite an annoying sound, uh, but it's a bit better than the sound of But um, the here is actually a synthesizer designed by a guy called Dan Stoll uh, in the SuperCloud language, which is the original language, which I've translated to Clojure in the overtone version. Beautiful thing here, actually, is that um, there's a side track. Uh, is that text becomes the way of describing timbre or the sound of sounds, um, and I can write that text and I can read it and un understand it. So I was able to read Dan's thing, translate it, which meant that that sound you heard, that sound, 
I actually understand it in my brains. Pretty cool. So I can see all the moving parts because I'm able to break it down to small parts. Um, but the, the point I'm trying to make here, how long have I got left? I only gave myself 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that um, I'm using Emacs to describe this stuff and design it like you might do the software process. But I'm also using Emacs to trigger it and control it. Right? So you saw there, I was able to actually just evaluate it and make the sounds and stop it. And I can go into um, the preview of a small thing we're going to do tonight. Uh, scratch. Minimax source. Uh, and base. Right? So you can sort of like define some things. And you can sort of... Oh! putting a float rate, 0.1. That oh, didn't work. And a full arc map. Oh, okay. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but I can I can just trigger loops like this, and now I can make them loop. I can stop the world, so if I get a handle, like foo, like this, and I can kill it that way. Um, but I can also control it now. Kind of thing, right? It's quite fun, right? So I'm seeing Emacs primarily my interface for actually manipulating these things on the fly. So, um, what does that mean? It means that I focus on something which is giving me a lot of feedback all the time. So you're seeing, like, the, when I'm evaluating things, they're going. I don't know if you can see that. Um, maybe in the larger forms, you can see that the whole thing is saying I'm evaluating. Maybe small little things. I'm sure you do a lot of times in, in your Emacs config, but actually become really important. And things like the autocomplete is really important, so I can see what's going on when I can. See that um, the, my what does group? I can get documentation. Although it's actually it doesn't look like this when it's normal font size. Um, but the, and the interesting thing about this is from a software perspective that once you've got something which actually is giving you documentation on the fly and in, in line, you actually feel bad when you haven't written some documents. So actually, this kind of thing actually starts to really help from a software development perspective because you think, well, actually, that should I should know what that is and I can't remember. Um, and so. Uh, I can give you more demonstrations about this. Maybe that's quite fun. Um, these grumbles are quite nice. Uh, if they play, ah, the result symbol grumbles group. I define that. I can sit on the train actually when I'm going to work or something and uh, play these things myself. It's nice. Though the temptation to actually go in and modify things is a bit too deep. Um, and there's lots of things to modify, like the overtone software, also the Emacs config about what it's doing. Um, and this is the kind of thing we're going to do tonight. It's going to be a lot more interesting because there's two of us. Question? Yes? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Code is your interface. Yeah, um, your interface. And I'm wondering, have you experimented with plugging in whatever MIDI instruments uh -huh. to control the code from your? Yeah. Uh, I can, I'll show you tonight with these things like uh, these Korg nano controllers. Yeah. So Overtone has like a uh, concurrent event stream. But so, for example, like a MIDI saxophone or whatever you. Can yeah, use. yeah, absolutely. Anything MIDI or open sound control or any kind of event mm -hmm. that you want to give to us, any computational event, we can do stuff with it. Um, and yeah, so actually, the interesting thing about the from the Emacs Live perspective is that. Um, Emacs turns out to be an incredible way of controlling very large granular con uh, things. So you want to move from one shift to another. Or, but the speed of coding is tiny compared to the speed of shifting a dial or moving a slider. So if you want much more fine grained control, you want to offset this. But the important, I guess, the philosophical point is that the controller thing shouldn't be a, a first class citizen. Controller should be a, a, something which overrides or sits on top of the code. Um, and so the code should be the thing you're actually writing. And if you can't do it from Emacs, then you shouldn't be able to do it at all. Um, 
that's the key, right? Well, let's say Emacs, I mean, like the A environment. And then the, the, the sliders make the job you would have to do rather than take 2,000 to, to 199 to 198, you know, rather than doing it manually, sliding a slider is much more intuitive. So, yep. Hello, yeah, that's better. So, uh, my day job is singing at Westminster Cathedral, and we've got oh, the Easter really? Vigil this evening. And uh, when You're not we do that, to my gig, then I'm afraid not, sadly. Oh. But the, I don't the, really listen the, to you the, the thing is, this is the, the, there's there's the, there's a really interesting thing here for me uh, about uh, making music with language. Uh, generally, if our director of music starts talking, things have gone badly wrong, and there's right. an obvious reason for that, which is that um, with speech it interferes with the sound. And right. the great thing about writing is that it doesn't interfere with the sound. But when you started talking about, for example, the importance of your various uh, code completion and, and documentation mechanisms, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. everything you've got going on the fly, I'm wondering, are you building something here which is almost like an intermediate between gesture and speech? Uh, yes, I think that's, that's a fair point to say. Actually, it is a new space. Um, certainly, with Overtone, we can sort of describe the timbre of sound and the structure of sounds. And with Emacs, we have a, a workflow for actually, and it's not just Emacs, you can use any environment which is closure. Uh, Emacs just ha happens to be very nice because I can extend it. Um, but yeah, it is that, it's, it's that intermediate stage where actually uh, it, I'm using the Emacs buffer in our practices to describe what we're going to do, and I'm actually doing a bit of coding then, but I'm also using it in the performance elements. So it is shifting between those roles, absolutely, yeah. Um, I think that's interesting. Yeah, there's all, all the stuff, like have you heard, has anyone heard of Undo Tree? Yeah, that's wicked, isn't it? So I use it all the time. Um, all the stuff, like a jump to cut chart thing, like if I want to go to like that D up there, like this this business, boom, there I am. Those kind of things like become really nice. Um, so all the small little like funky things that people have written, just I'm pulling them all in. And so just to give you a quick guide, so uh, uh, overtone Emacs Live is a, actually it's a better website than this. So this is the repository. Um, and it's like we've got like the music-y stuff going on. Um, and the key thing really is that I'm, I'm doing it in a way that if someone else wants to use this, so they're not necessarily like hardcore Emacs hackers, and they haven't got their own complicated, interesting setup, they just want to drag a folder and drop it in their emacs.d directory, and it just works. That's what Emacs Live is. So it can get you started pretty quick. Um, and the idea is then hopefully they start tweaking themselves, and they just clone it, and then maybe they delete everything and start again. That would be beautiful. But uh, just to get them started is the key thing. Um, and wave structuring all the stuff. So I've got this notion of a pack, which is like a, quite a, a, a high grains, like composite element. So it's not like a, uh, a package you might have on an L, L node, whatever it's called. No, not L node. L, L, what, I don't know. I don't even use it, so I don't even know what the name is. But the package management stuff that's recently come into Emacs, uh, it's much more uh, high grains. So we can look at one of these packs. Uh, for example, like uh, there's a closure pack which pulls in all the stuff I do with Clojure, and I structure the directory in a specific way. So I have um, an init file, which actually is the thing which gets loaded up first, which then pulls up other stuff. And I've created little functions that pull in all the config files. Um, so here I can pull in things which perhaps are already on the, the load path, or I can actually pull in config files. And then in the config directory, then I have specific set of config files for different components. So I have one for overtone, one for par edits, for example. That's how I'm modifying par edits, uh, and I add some of my own things which don't quite match necessarily how a par edit functions the way I work with Clojure. So I can override things, I can monkey patch stuff, uh, and I can also pull in libraries. Uh, here I have like live add pack lib. So I have libraries in a particular structure, so my libraries go into the lib directory. So this is able to find the library and put it in for me. Um, and so then I obviously have a lib directory. which sits there with all the stuff I'm pulling in. Um, and so, like Fuzzy, uh, there's someone else's module I'm pulled in. Um, and the way I typically work is all these things are actually Gits and modules in the development part. And I'm able to actually link specifically to specific uh, Git uh, commits. And if I don't like it, I'll fork it and make my own and then link to that. Uh, and then I have a, a, a normal brand, or a normal uh, part of, the, of Git Emacs Live, which is just everything pulled in, uh, which doesn't use some modules, which how people can just pull it down to their .emacs.d directory without having to use Git or anything like that. Um, and so this just allows me to structure it in a way where it actually makes sense for development. And any questions about people 
they say, well, I don't like the colour mode you've got. So I've got like this crazy cyberpunk theme which I've written. Also got this Gandalf theme which is pretty crazy. Um, like when, a, when a, 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 a menu where the lighting isn't very good. And they say, well, I don't like your themes. Well, they don't have to pull in that colour pack, for example. Um, and so they're able to also, someone said, oh, your Emacs Live is only focused on closure and I want to do, uh, I don't know, Perl development. Well, that's fine. You create yourself a Perl pack and then link to it and then people can pull it in and it just will work. And you don't have to be specific in terms of just using the Perl library. You can actually start to describe all the ways you're specifically configuring that in a way that actually matches your needs. And that's, to me, that's quite a nice way of approaching it. So I'm not seeing this as a development environment that everyone's going to use and it's going to be super generic. It's, it can't be that way because it's my violin and it's my saxophone. So it has to be completely tailored to the way I work. But if that happens to be useful for other people, then that's awesome. Um, but that means also that it's not just a case of me pulling in different modes. It's a case of me pulling in the modes and configuring them in exactly the way I want them to be. And, and the, the crucial thing I've learned from this is that um, if you can do that, if you can pull all these different modes in, you have to spend quite a bit of time actually getting them to bind together well. They're not always completely compatible. Um, and so that's quite a lot of work, actually, saying I've got this mode and this mode, but they don't quite gel. And so tweaking them so they do gel, and maybe that requires you to send some patches, or maybe they don't accept the patches, so you've got to fork it. And that's what I'm doing with Emacs Live, is it's, if you use Emacs Live the way I use it, and there's something that does not quite right, I'll fix it, you know, because it's my problem. Um, because I care about the way it all gels together. But if you're using it with some random other thing, well, that's your problem. You know, that's, that's not what I want to do. Um, and so my sort of curation big pack, one big com uh, config, uh, it gives people a way to get started, but also it's like a, it's, it creates its own little community. So we have a little Emacs Live community who, there's hundreds of developers using this, sending me patches, sending me comments. I hate the way it does the flickering text when you start. And the fact that people just hate it means I keep it because it uh, causes contention and I like that. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's not a development environment, it's a, it's, a, it's a violin. So it really can be what I wanted to be. And, and if people like it, that's brilliant. And if they don't, well, fine. You know, like fork it or don't use it, it's fine. Um, and so this approach seems to work out quite well. That makes sense? Yeah. So like, uh, the way I'm saying it is like, I've only got four years of Emacs development, but I'm able to create something by pulling in all of your guys' work and everyone else who's working on Emacs together in, in a way that actually works for my needs. And by polishing it in a way that makes it super easy for anyone to install it. That is, I can install a script and it'll install all the things for you. you. It'll create you a user pack so you can put your own configurations in that so that you can actually develop your own style that's not too different from Emacs Live and then be able to update Emacs Live without having to worry about conflicts. Um, it means that people can use it for very easily. That creates that community and that, that, that's actually it is a beautiful thing to be able to, to use your creation skill to pull something together that people can use nicely uh, and not have to worry about themselves, how do I get... Because the, when you hear, see people trying to learn closure, they'll say, well, how do I get the autocomplete working at the same time as par edit? And well, those rainbow parentheses, they, go, they look pretty cool. How do I get those installed? And well, how do you get that? And all these questions, and there's no clear way to start. Um, and so by creating something which is that starting point, then you give lots of people something for free, but also you hopefully get them more excited to actually get engaged with Emacs even more. Because if the, the first, cause Emacs, vanilla Emacs is rubbish, in my opinion. Um, and the way it just is horrible, and like, or even like the basic things, like um, fuzzy completion in the down here. Where are we? So you know, here, I can start, start to type in. Uh, I've got this calc thing down there. I can say KK, and oh no, it's not. That's not there. Uh, oh, there we are. It'll fuzzy complete that for me. That kind of thing isn't actually part of Emacs as default. And that's, uh, it's a shame. So with Emacs Live, it is those kind of things. People don't even have to ask me those questions. This, is this making sense? Yeah. So uh, don't use Emacs Live. Create your own. Right? And then share with the world. That's the way forwards. And get more people using Emacs. Yeah. Oh, and uh, come, come to the gig tonight, 7.30. There's free pizzas and free beers. How cool is that? Yeah. And uh, you'll see this in more action. And actually, it, it, it was pretty cool what we're doing. Yeah. Questions? Any other questions? Sorry. I was just uh, briefly wondering how Emacs Live interacts with the shiny new package system that we. It doesn't have. at all in any kind of way, shape, or form. Any plans uh, that way? Uh, no, not personally. Um, I don't understand how the new package management stuff works. I've not spent the time to understand it um, because I don't need it because I'm using Git some modules. 
Um, but if anyone else who does want to use it and tries to wants to try and get it work with Emacs Live, then go for it and send me commit uh, pull requests. Oh, there's a cool website as well, by the way. Um, you should see it. Uh, actually, it looks just like Emacs. <laughs> So my question is a follow-up on my previous question about uh, devices that hook into this thing. Yeah. And I'm just wondering um, if you capture a trace of the device as executable code, therefore you could replay. Re so you know you plug in your saxophone, you play through the saxophone. Can you replay that as a loop? Yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily call the trace as, as executable code, but certainly the events coming into the system are data structures which are accreting. Uh, which you which all have timestamps. So certainly you could store the uh, incoming events from the saxophone as a data structure, persist that, and then be able to interpret it back. And and that opens you up to by seeing it as data rather than code, although they're necessarily the same thing. But seeing it as data allows you to then to interpret it the way you want. You could stretch it out, you could shrink it, you could do like bark style flipping or slicing or all sorts of stuff. Absolutely, I haven't we haven't actually focused on recording our events yet. Um, mainly because it hasn't been an important thing for us. Um, but and I, I watched, watched this uh, video of this DJ guy, German guy, who was doing this crazy set to all these, these things. And he was saying that uh, he personally he listens, he records all of his sets and listens to them back. But he doesn't do the kind of thing you're describing because he feels it actually would uh, impinge on his creativity. And that he would find something which worked well and then keep using that. Whereas by destroying everything he's created, basically, you have to recreate it, and the, the, the process of recreation actually creates, puts him into new spaces he's never been before. And that actually works really well for us as well. Yeah, but uh, certainly for in terms of like uh, uh, considering the new forms of notation for music, when you start to use the computer, you can start to obviously, as I described before, represent timbre, but you can also represent all the events, and that can be part of the notation to, to, for future study and for future consideration, and that's very important. Yeah. More questions? Anyone else? Anyone else going to use their uh, Emacs as an instrument? One person? Uh, uh, that's two people, that's great. Uh, Three people. You're not that excited though, I don't believe you because you're not going to come to the gig, so... <laughs> You've got some better singing events. <laughs> sorry, sorry, what did you say? You're excited about... I missed you, I actually didn't even... <laughs> so how insulting, sorry. So this is one of the four days in the year when I absolutely have to be at work, sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. You're excused, absolutely. Thank you for being here and thank you for listening to my talk. Thank you everyone. <laughs>